This is a 20-sided die, and it's a real-world RNG. Every time it's rolled, it generates a random number from 1 to 20, with each number having the same chance of showing up. So how do you go about implementing something like this on a computer? And what does that even look like for an 8-bit system like the Nintendo? Well, in order to answer these questions, we have to start with a much simpler one. What does it even mean for something to be random? When you call something random, you're basically saying that it's unpredictable and doesn't follow any kind of pattern. When I roll this d20, I have no idea what number will show up until it lands. And the sequence of numbers that do appear have no direct connection to one another. When you think about it, having something so purely unpredictable is kind of amazing, and it's easy to see why it's used in so many games. For instance, when is this hammer bro gonna chuck a hammer? If he always does so at the same fixed rate, then the hammers are easy to predict, which means that they're easy to dodge. But if he throws them randomly, then you don't know when the next hammer's gonna hit, making the whole situation more dynamic and hopefully fun. So breaking it down, creating a random number generator on a computer means writing a program that outputs a number in some range, like one to 20, one to a million, whatever you want. And the numbers that the program spits out are unpredictable and don't follow a discernible pattern. Unfortunately for a computer program, that's not really possible. If you want to get a number that's truly random, you have to sample something from nature. Things like atmospheric noise in radio waves or fluctuations in temperature. Now, there are ways to get this kind of information into a computer using specialized hardware, but the NES doesn't have that hardware, so you kind of have to fake it using something called a pseudo-random number generator. Pseudo basically means imitation, and PRNGs are a way to make numbers that appear random, but if you look close enough, follow a predictable pattern. In some cases, this pattern can be leveraged, like when speedrunners hack a game's RNG to get desirable loot drops or encounters. A good PRNG is capable of creating very large lists of numbers that are statistically close to random, though they eventually repeat. If the list is large enough, then it's pretty easy to fool a human. And if it's really big, it's even possible to pull one over on a computer, allowing for some sophisticated RNGs to be used in applications like computer security and cryptography. For video games, we don't need anything quite that advanced and can use tech that was developed back in the 1960s. The name's kind of a mouthful, though. They're called linear feedback shift registers, and preferably you want ones that are in a Galois configuration. Yeah, I'll just... I'll just show you how they work. So if you take a number like 87 and convert it into binary, you end up with this nice little grid of ones and zeros. The whole idea behind the algorithm is to use this binary data to generate a new random number using a couple of simple operations. The first one is called a right shift, and all it does is move each of the bits one position to the right. We fill the left side with a zero and let the right side fall off, though we will keep it around since we'll need it in just a moment. The second operation is called exclusive or, and it kind of works like the word or in English. For instance, if I ask, do you want sushi or pizza? Most folks know that I'm offering one or the other, but not both. On a computer, exclusive or does something similar when combining two bits. If the bits are different, then the operation outputs a one, but if they're the same, then it outputs a zero. And this is how the algorithm shuffles up the bits to make them look random. After performing the shift, it uses exclusive or to combine the bit that fell off with others at special positions in the data called taps. If this carry bit is zero, then the operations don't have any effect, meaning we've just shifted the data one position to the right. But if the bit is one, as is the case with the number 87, then each of the bits are flipped, changing things dramatically. Every time you perform the process, you end up creating one random bit. So if you repeat it eight times, you can build a single eight bit random number. If you start with the number 87, then the next number in the list will be 192. Repeating the process again gives you 201, then 55, 32, and so on. With an 8-bit random number generator like this one, you can create 255 high-quality random numbers until the pattern repeats. Expand the generator to use 16 bits, and you get over 65,000 numbers. At 24 bits, you get well over 16 million, and at 32 bits, you can generate a whopping 4.29 billion numbers before they begin to repeat. For NES games, generally 16 bits is more than enough, but you can jump to 24 if you need to generate a lot of numbers. And as far as the algorithm is concerned, that's pretty much it. Unfortunately, there's still one big glaring issue. Even if you've coded this fancy PRNG, how do you choose the number that you start with? So if you write a game that always chooses the same starting number, then the random number generator will always produce the same sequence of outputs. This often means that with correct play, the game becomes 100% predictable. This could be a desirable trait for some games, but usually when you're using an RNG, you want things to be 
unpredictable, so you somehow have to program the game to choose a different starting number every time it's played. This number is called the random seed, and on the Nintendo, there are a couple of pretty good ways to choose it. A common way that's used in various games is to set up a counter that ticks through all the possible seed numbers on the title screen. The basic idea here is that during every rendering frame, you add one to the seed, allowing it to grow and wrap around until the player starts the game. Since the NES runs at 60 frames a second, it's very hard, though not impossible, for a human to purposefully select a specific seed, meaning the RNG will almost certainly be different for each play session. Another way that was used in games like Final Fantasy is to use random bits from an uninitialized memory location. On real hardware, RAM isn't automatically set to all zeros when the system boots up, and pretty much contains a bunch of random bits due to various electrical effects on its transistors. So you can get a pretty good random seed right when the game boots by just grabbing it from an untouched address in memory. However, many emulators set the RAM to straight zeros when a game is reset, so in that case this method won't exactly work. Though some emulators, like Misen, take this into consideration. Now, no matter how you go about choosing your random seed, there is one big caveat. You can never choose a value of zero. Because of how the algorithm works, if you start with a zero, then the operations will have no effect, so you'll just end up generating a zero over and over again. But this is pretty easy to prevent. Just calculate the random seed using either method, check its value, and swap it for any other number if you find a zero. And with that, we have everything we need to program a D20 on a Nintendo. But like with everything else RNG related, we still have to be a little careful how we do it. Because the RNG is 8-bit, this means every number will fall between 0 and 255. But for a D20, we need those numbers to fall between 1 and 20. So basically, we have to write a routine to scale this bigger range down into a smaller one. And the most direct way to do this is using division. When you use a calculator to divide two numbers, you usually end up with a decimal result, but that's not what we really want here. Instead, we want to do the division by hand, so we end up with a result and a remainder. If you divide by 20, the remainder will always be a number between 0 and 19, so all you have to do is add 1 to get the desired range. And most modern programming languages have an easy way to get this, using something called modulus division. But on the NES, it's a bit more involved. Long story short, the NES doesn't have a hardware way to do division, meaning if you want to use this method, you have to write a division routine yourself, and that's pretty slow. If you're really clever, you can program your RNG to be blazingly fast, but even in the best case, doing the division is about five times slower. Slower. So using the division method, it's six times slower to roll a D20 than it is to roll a D256. Another issue is that when you use division like this, for certain ranges you can introduce some serious bias, meaning some numbers are more likely to show up than others. Thankfully, there's a really simple way to solve both of these problems, using something called rejection sampling. You start by throwing away each of the higher order bits in the number until it falls into the range that is as close as possible to your target without going under. For our range of 20, this would mean tossing out the three highest bits, which truncates the value to fall between 0 and 31. Next, you test if this restricted number falls in the desired range. And if it doesn't, then you just roll another 8-bit random number and repeat the process until you find one that works. For the D20, the algorithm will eventually find a number that falls between 0 and 19, at which point you simply add 1 to get the desired output. Now, this seems like it could take a lot of tries, but if you do the math, it turns out on average the whole routine only takes about twice as long as generating an 8-bit random number. And when you're programming an underpowered 8-bit computer from the 1980s, 2x is way better than 6x. That's it, I'm done. That is how you program a D20 on the NES. If you're interested in playing with some real RNG code that you can assemble yourself and run in an emulator, you're in luck. I put together a repository on GitHub that implements the D20 along with a bunch of other examples that you can use in your own NES games. The link is down in the description. And of course, if you're interested in the computer science and mathematics behind today's episode, check out this video's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is hands down the best interactive way to learn the fundamentals of computer science and mathematics. They have a great course on probability that touches on randomness and how to make predictions about how random numbers behave in a complex system, like a video game. Brilliant is free to try for 30 days, so head over to brilliant.org slash nesthacker and sign up today. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. 